Last weekend, I talked about a project uh, on the live stream. It was about a tray that I built specifically to work in this tank. And uh, so here's the tray. I'm gonna show it to you one more time. And the reason for this video is because I wanted to remove Mahanos. And while there are different solutions you can use, like Kalkwasser paste, or you could use Joe's juice, you could use a laser, you could use the Mahana wand, which is electricity. There's a lot of methods, but you know what? This tank was filled with hundreds and hundreds of Mahanos. It was, I would say there's probably 300 in there, maybe more. And it was so thick and rich with them, it kind of looked like I had a pagoda cup growing out throughout my reef. So I wanted to make myself a workstation that I could put on top of the tank. I could put the rock here. I could scrape off the Mahanos one after another until they're off the rock, you know, not make my arms tired. And basically I stood in front of this tank for about three hours. I don't know if this will be an interesting video for you or not, but I haven't seen very much documentation about ripping an enemies off of rocks. And uh, I thought, this is one I'll film. I mean, you know, because sometimes the best solution is just to get your hands dirty. And that's the thing, in this hobby, it's not always just gonna work out perfectly. Things are gonna go wrong, you're gonna have pests, you ignore the situation, they grow and breed and make way more of themselves than you'd ever want. And then at some point you have to make a decision. Now, I'm sure many hobbyists would have said the simplest solution is take all the rock out of the tank, soak it in muriatic acid, soak it in vinegar, blast it with a hose. But for me, I just felt like if I just take out one rock at a time, scrape off all the pests and put the rock back in, good enough. And so I spent, like I said, about three hours total time working on this tank. And now they're 99% gone. There's a couple here and there, and I'm going to continue to eradicate them one by one. And I'll probably laser the last of them, but there was no way I was going to be hitting so many of them. There was just too many. It would have taken forever. And uh, so here are some of the tools I used. I wanted to just give you a close up of these really quick. So this is a dental tool that I actually got from the dentist. I said, I want this. And it has a flat blade right here on the front. I'm hoping this is in focus. If not, I'll zoom in and in post-production. Then I have, a couple pair, uh, I have a pair of forceps or tweezers, and I just had them here in the tray. And then finally, I had some bone cutters. And I really like these because not only do they cut, but they're rounded. And so they can kind of get into the nooks and crannies. And there were spots where I just cut some rock off to get at the pest that was inside a hole. And I just worked in my tray. And I had it filled up with Mahanos, and I took it to the sink, and using cold water, I rinsed it out of the tray. That's the main point. I just wanted to get across to you that there is a way to remove these things from your tank systematically, and it's not gonna have to be the nuclear option because I still have the same fish in this tank. I still have all my anemones up here from uh, that came from the anemone cube. I've even got one way down here in the back that's about this big and uh, survived just fine. It was blown through the tank and is attached somewhere else. This will work with Aptasia as well as Mahanos, but this video is specifically about Mahanos. One thing I'm sure you'll agree with, that this is a very discouraging situation, one that you definitely would not want to tackle either. Once out of the water, this one rock easily had 70 Mahanos that needed removal. This is going to be tedious work, but if you have a good music playlist or you just want to clear your mind, scraping these pests off the rock may be just the thing. You'll notice some of these really don't want to come off the rock, while others pop off quite easily. The more you remove, the seemingly easier it seems to get things to consider might be to wear gloves if you wish. Myself, I didn't feel the need. I wear glasses, but if you do not, be sure to wear eye protection in case these anemones squirt water towards your face. Also, keep your mouth shut for the exact same reason. Overall, I scraped off about a dozen rocks, maybe more. Some areas were cleared quickly since, it was a dead, since there was dead coral skeleton instead of just actual rock, allowing me to just pry off a patch at a time. You can use blue lighting to spot them, reviewing your rock by turning it around and around, as I often found another one hidden on the underside. As you're working these, you can turn the rock on its side, and that will make the anemones hang another direction, and you can get to the foot and just pry them right off. Sometimes chipping away at the rock with bone cutters was necessary to get all of the animal out, as you don't want to leave behind any bits of tissue, because it may very well grow into a new anemone. That is why you see me continually scraping away at smaller bits. I definitely don't want to have to do this all over again. As soon as I'm done, this rock goes back into the tank and then I pull out another one and continue. 
The biggest benefit of this process is that you complete the job in a matter of days, restoring the tank back to what it should look like without destroying the bacteria in and on the rock itself. With all the rocks devoid of pests, you can re-aquascape to get the look you like. If you get tired, just take a break. There's no reason to do all of this in a single session, but you definitely want to get back to this project within a day or two since Mahanos have the tendency to spread across the rock work. They like to be in the light, which is why you saw them on the rock work in plain sight, unlike Aptasia that may be anywhere in the reef, even in dark spots deep within your rock structures. Mahanos will also climb up the walls of aquariums, clinging to corals, power heads, power cords, cleaning magnets, any surface that's getting hit with light basically. Some of you may wonder what's wrong with these and why do they need to be removed? Well, they spread quite rapidly, covering the rock work that could otherwise be used for coral placement. You might even like the look of them and run a tank filled with them. When I first spotted some of these in the fish store a long time ago, I thought they were pretty enough to buy some. I paid 20 bucks for four of them, and within a few weeks there were 50 in my 29 gallon aquarium. Basically, they are tribbles, and most hobbyists don't want these in their system. None of these were able to pass through the tiny holes in the tray, by the way. And one tiny suggestion, put a small sponge in your tray to wipe your tool against to clean it off. That will make it a lot easier during the process of doing this task. Now, if you have some on the back wall of the aquarium, I found that I could just use the forceps or tweezers and just pull them right off. Usually, if you get them quick, you can just kind of snag them off. Maybe they'll come off with the coralline that's on the back of your tank. Otherwise, just once or twice and you'll pull it right off. If you watch closely, you'll notice that I not only do I pull off one, but I pull off two at once right there. Pow! That was awesome. And there's a few more in that corner in the far right. So I had to work. This was kind of a spot that was in the shadow. It was tough to see. And I worked my way down there and removed them one by one. You could use a scraper or a credit card of some kind of tool to remove these from the walls of your tank manually, but make sure you pick them up and get them out of the tank so they don't just drift off and land somewhere else. While each rock is out of the water, you may discover little things that you need to put back in the tank, like hermit crabs, which are part of your cleanup crew. And as you look closely in these videos now, you'll see some Ahanos here and there, but most of them are gone. And it, it just looks so much cleaner to me, and I feel a lot better. I'm so glad I finally tackled this project and took care of it. It makes me super happy that this tank is all cleaned up, and I did it minimally invasively. Basically, I just had to tackle it one rock at a time. I exposed a rock to air for 10 or 15 minutes at a time, and then put it back in the tank. And I didn't have any weird swings. I didn't, have a, I didn't lose the coralline. I uh, didn't have... A ammonia spike or a cycle. All I did was just solve the problem and move forward. And that's really what reef keeping should be. We should be able to figure out what's wrong, get in there, handle it, even if you have to do it manually, and then enjoy your tank again, like I'm about to do. Dang it, there's a few I missed. So I will have to definitely work around these clownfish. Now you've seen how it's done. It's really not an overwhelming project, it's just a tedious one, but I feel like it's really a great way to go to keep your tank running smoothly and not have to start from scratch, when it really wasn't more than just an infestation of a single pest. Here's a little bit of bonus footage for sticking around to the end. The point I wanted to make was it'll, it took two or three hours. I didn't do it all on the same day. I did an hour. Matter of fact, it was funny, my best friend called me and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm killing Mahanos, I'm ripping them off rocks. And she was watching me on FaceTime, and she's like, okay. And she told me about her day. And then, you know, she called me a couple days later, and how are you doing? And I was like, I'm fine. And she says, what are you working on? I said, these Mahanos. She's like, okay. Because, you know, I, I had worked on one section, and then I worked on the next section, and then yesterday I finished up over on that end. And you'll see the before and afters, but I'm super happy to have gotten those out of the tank because now I can place corals in here and not worry about pest and enemies stinging the corals. Also, I don't have to... Uh, worry about fighting for space, you know, for what I can put in here. The tank's cleaned up. It's great. I am, I'm still kind of on the fence about possibly removing the substrate because it's a very coarse uh, gravel, and I'm thinking about just replacing it with some sand. I know people like to have a frag rack in there, or they like to have egg crate in there. I like to have rock. Uh, these are some of my own personal choices, and uh, I need to get the water squared away. The water parameters are still not right. But, all right, so that's while we're looking at the tank. I might as well feed my little fish. There's a coral beauty in here. 
a six line wrasse, about four or five clownfish that are mainly rescues, and there's a cleaner shrimp in there. I've got a huge sand conch on the bottom in the very back right corner, right behind that purplish rock. All the rock you're seeing in there has got coralline on it that grew naturally. Let's go ahead and feed these guys. I'll just hit the button on the Eheim auto feeder. So it's gonna drop into the Eheim chimney, which is another one of my acrylic solutions I came up with years ago, which keeps the food in the water and it'll drizzle through that little chimney area and then come over to these clowns where they can get it and it won't go into the overflow, which was the goal. And uh, so you'll see over there in the upper right corner, let's see if I can get us there a little bit better. You can see the activity of the fish all going to that spot. And so they get a snack that way. Every night, of course, I feed this fish, uh, this fish tank with uh, frozen food as well, which is usually PE mysis, Rod's food, Rod's clownfish eggs, <laughs> clownfish eggs, Rod's uh, fish eggs. And um, well, they're orange, they could come from a clownfish. <laughs> Uh, there's also uh, some krill in there, which maybe would land in one of the anemones. And um, what else do I put in there? Uh, some bloodworms. That's all part of the concoction that I mix up every night. And I pour it into all three tanks. So some goes into this tank, a little bit for these fish. And some goes into the uh, anemone cube. And then, of course, the 400-gallon gets its own batch of food.